say triple threat and anyone who is an aficionado of entertainment would think automatically, ooh, Judy Garland, Liza Minnelli, uh, right up to Leslie Odom Jr., even Beyonce, those who can sing, act, and dance. And they usually do it with such proficiency that everyone wants them. The next name that you hear that's going to be a big triple threat will come from Barbados. I don't know who this person will be, but I probably can guess where they come from. Operation Triple Threat. Today, we are here with the founder, Janelle Headley, as part of Pivot Series Season 2, The Pivot Pioneers. Janelle, it is an absolute pleasure to have you here. I feel like I have to project because you know, I'm in the I'm in the, I'm in the space of greatness and you want projection. <laughs> you want drama. Thank you so much for having me here. It's, it's an honor to be here. I am really happy that you said yes to this opportunity for a number of reasons. I don't think anyone in the series, either before or since, has really managed to cover the gamut of entertainment and the arts in particular. What is Operation Triple Threat and what was it born of? So Operation Triple Threat is a charity. It is dedicated to empowering young people through the performing arts. And a triple threat is what the industry calls someone who can sing that to that, as you greatly introduced us <laughs> when you started. And um, this is a threat to anyone in industry because you can do the job that three people might normally do, right. but it's all packaged in one person. Um, and so we exist because we felt there is a need for young people to operate at a high standard and to, to expect a high standard from them and that in doing so that will cause them to rise to the occasion and be even more than what they thought they could be. And so we started out as a camp but now we are an after school program that runs with the academic school year and um, we not only train students in singing, dancing and acting, but our modus operandi is to cater to the whole person. So we have uh, six programs and services that do that, which is the training in singing, dancing and acting, scholarships to come into the program, also our bridge award program, which allows students to take part in short term and long term studies overseas at the tertiary level. We also have our MUSE program, our social support program, our academic support program. So um, we, we put all those together to really support our students to be the best they can be as people first and then artists. Janelle, you said it was a registered charity, but this actually sounds like it could easily be a school. My 80 self soft thing. I saw you as Debbie Allen with your stick and your tutu and all of it, but what is it that you have been able to put together in this curriculum that makes it so different from anything else you've ever seen in Barbados? Um, I think it is uh, something that I alluded to earlier, which is the standard that we re require of the students. Um, we give them the opportunity to take part in international uh, quality work. Um, they are in, you know, well worked through scripts that they are able to stick their teeth into and to really explore. Um, we have quality tutors who train them in various genres, in, in dance in, um, and in, in different acting methods and vocal, uh, vocal techniques. Um, and But I think the special sauce, if you want to kind of call it that, would be that the approach that I mentioned earlier about uh, catering to the whole person. When somebody walks into our audition process, because we start with the audition process, mm -hmm. um, that can seem quite daunting. So when you're coming to our audition, already that person has some sort of drive in them, right. right? They may not be the best singer or dancer or actor, but they have this desire for excellence and mm -hmm. this desire to be better than they are they are right now. And then when they get in, then they definitely see that we require time commitment, you know, that in putting in those hours of practice that then they're going to come to this level of excellence that we require of them. But then coupled with that is we're looking at the whole person. I believe that you can't really 
really inspire and change someone's life. If you don't meet them where they are and you don't cater to their mental, their emotional, their social needs. So if you are hungry, come into rehearsal. I'm drilling you on a eight count all the time or a 16 count and, and you're lethargic. I can't, I, I can't look over that and just go, okay, get it. I need to go and figure out, did you eat breakfast this morning? Did mm. you have lunch? Um, and so our, our program is set up to really take care of the, the entire person so that then they are open and available to really absorb the information and not just be a machine that can sing, dance and act, mm -hmm. but can really truthfully give themselves to the work and inject themselves into the work to make it themselves their own. Because we don't want clones. We want people who can be individuals and right. unique and really take whatever path they, they want to go. So even if you're in the program um, and you're doing singing and acting, acting, it doesn't mean that that's the only thing you're going to do. The skills that you get um, make you a whole person. So if you end up in law, if you end up being a doctor, if you end up in construction, whatever it is, you're going to be the kind of person that thinks outside of the box and mm -hmm. is a good team player that has a high level of excellence. And I think those combination of things are what make OTT OTT. So this is a very holistic program. Yes, definitely. If we had to put one word to it, just holistic, looking at the whole person. Yeah. But you, yourself, Janelle Headley, mm -hmm. you actually came from a performing background. You were, and maybe you still are, I'm not sure, but you were a budding vocal performer. I've had a couple of tracks that I've been able to bless the Barbadian stages with on radio. How did you make that transition from performer to administrator, coach, teacher, mentor? Well, I always taught as, as soon as I came out of university, even while I was singing, but I would say that the transition was a lemons to lemonade um, transition, how I became fully involved in OTT. Um, as an artist, as you said, you know, I was singing, I had done jazz festivals in, in here and overseas. I had put out records, but um, I didn't, have the team show up for me in a way that was constructive, in a way that was, that I felt like I, they saw me as an artist and got where I was going. And I was quite disillusioned and I was quite sad about where I was and not having, knowing that I should keep going even though I'm going to get all the no's. Like I didn't have that, which is something I tell my students all the time. Like mm. no's are part of the process. Right. Um, but I didn't necessarily have that in my corner and I was like you know I feel like I have talent but it's not necessarily materializing even as quickly as I want and you know I also tell my students you're playing the long game here it's not it's not about the short term mm -hmm. um so out of my disillusionment and, and my disappointment I said to myself I don't want this to happen to somebody else behind me because I feel like there's so much talent, but it doesn't necessarily get to flourish because it's an entertainment business. Mm -hmm. And there are like 80 to 90% of it is the business the and the part. network part. Yeah. Um, so as talented as you, you are, if you don't have that support, um, you can fall prey to lots of things out there and you can feel disappointed and stuck. And so, I took the journey to Canada, back to Canada, because I had studied in Canada, to study artist management. But then life happened. Yeah. And um, uh, actually, this actually links back to why OTT is the way it is. My mental health was suffering during that period of time. Oh. And it was, it was a struggle for me to even want to be alive. And so I couldn't finish my studies. Um, and so I had to go through a period of healing and restoration there. And finally I got myself back together and started back school again, had 4.0 and then life happened again. Um, I was married at the time and um, the, the immigration didn't want to renew both of our immigration status. So I had to leave again after that. So then it was disappointment again. Like I'm trying to do this good thing mm -hmm. out of my lemons, yeah. but it wasn't working out. And then I know this is a long winded story, but I'm into it. <laughs> it's a good story. Uh, I started baking. And funny enough, I found out that baking is actually quite therapeutic 
And a lot of artists are into baking at some point in their lives. And I was baking and, and that was taking off. Um, but then the artist side of me in terms of singing, dancing, acting was still sort of like calling out to me, but I didn't have the strength or the bravery yet to sing. Right. Um, and so a friend reached out about um, helping edit a musical. And in doing that, I said, but who's going to be in this musical like on the island? Like, I'm not sure there's enough people here with the experience and the training to put this on. Right. And I said, this is kind of a long-winded approach, but I think maybe we should test out some sort of training program, maybe a camp, and see if young people are interested in this. And let's see if it catches on and see if, you know, they like it. And then I know it's long, but you're investing in these young people and then they'll get the skills and then maybe we can then put on something of, of a good quality mm -hmm. once you've invested in them. So we did that. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the students just loved it. And then um, I couldn't let it go um, because I saw that what we were doing was working for them, but it was also healing for me. Mm -hmm. It was me being able to create, be creative um, without being in the limelight with all of my nerves and everything about that. Right. Um, and pouring into them, <laughs> help them as much as it helped me. And so that's basically how OTT came to be, you know, um, through out, you know, out of my lemon situation, right, right. Um, choosing to pour myself into others and to make it different for others coming on after me. Wow. Now that was just a phenomenal, eye-opening, soul-opening story. But as we alluded to earlier, 80 to 90% of this is the business of the art. Mm -hmm. How did you manage to basically develop a business model for something there's really no template for here in Barbados? Um, great question. I think it's a combination of research and then an organic flow, if that makes any sense. So I explain. So uh, what we're doing here is not necessarily new. Um, there are many institutions in the world who have done this and done it right. So um, we did a lot of research on how to make, um, how to teach this, how to uh, even schedule singing, dancing, and acting in a way that um, works for the student and how to even put on then productions so that each thing sort of builds on each other and so on. Um, and this is after the camp, you know, we realized, okay, this is not going away. So we also did um, upgrades. So we went to various workshops and uh, training seminars. And I, I, I personally read a lot. Like I, I look up things all the time or check out YouTube and so on. So we did a lot of training um, that way to, to make sure that we were doing that we had best practices in terms of right. training and development. In terms of the, maybe the intangibles a bit, it would be organic in that there was one year in particular where we decided it, we wouldn't do a licensed show because of financial reasons. Right. But again, this was a blessing in disguise. Um, and so we created something based on the students' lives. And in order to do that, we had to have a lot of conversations with them. And these conversations quickly got, became really deep. Mm. You, Young people are, if you give them a chance, they're so ready and willing to share if you, if you create a safe space. And so out of these conversations, we realized um, even clearer that we needed to make sure that mental health was taken care of and that the um, whole person was taken care of. And so that's where the social support arm of OTT really was birth out of these conversations, out of creating work, hearing the need, the students, um, recognizing that the students needed more help than just these conversations. Mm -hmm. And also personally recognizing that this was way up out of what I could manage personally, because I take it all on. And, and then seeking again for them professional assistance to then build the, out that arm of OTT. So, um, yeah, so it's a combination of 
looking at what's done before. Mm -hmm. And then the students feedback, like we, OTT, I always say to them, would not exist without the students. We always ask them for feedback on how things are going, what's working, what's not, so that we can make sure we remain relevant for them and that we're not also just transplanting something from somewhere else, that it is actually going to work for them in the context of Barbados, where we are right now. Yeah. Now, through a good friend and colleague who you might know as part of the Pivot Series, I had the opportunity to work alongside OTT on something that was developmental, something that you believed you needed and was part of the continued growth of the program. And the first thing I noticed is that this group of young singers, actors, and dancers, little OTTers, they are unusually close and supportive like it's a part of a fraternity <laughs> unspoken how do you get students who would have had no knowledge of each other probably before they met under the same roof how do you get them to buy into the ethos of ott ah uh, great question um i've been thinking about this for a while and i think part of it a big part of it is just because we create a safe space um, one of the things I say to the students a lot is feel forward. And in order for them to feel forward, to take that risk, they really need to feel seen and heard. Mm. And I think also whether you're a kid or an adult, if you feel like you're a stakeholder in something, like like this thing can't happen without you, mm -hmm. you sort of, your posture changes. Ah. You realize that this is, this is important. And so if I'm late and I've got, all my team members waiting on me. That's a big deal. So I'm not going to be late. Yes. <laughs> you yes. know? So I think that the that part of it is is really key to us being close. I've, I've even been told we seem like a cult. Um, <laughs> that's a bit extreme. A bit extreme. I didn't mean that close, but no. <laughs> I know, but but I can understand it because there is that mutual respect. Yes. And it's, it's not just... Um, I don't even see it as bottom up or top down. It is uh, um, really a shared sort of knowing that we each matter. Yes. And when they know that they can give feedback and we're gonna actually listen to it and troubleshoot and like try to make it work for everybody. And um, also when they, you know, we really are intentional about, about what we say to them. So we talk about failing forward. We talk about success is when opportunity meets preparation. Mm -hmm. um, we're always speaking things into their lives because we think that's important. Um, there is when you walk into our space, there is a board uh, um, on the wall. And every month there is an intentional uh, theme, an in intentional message that the students get. Um, and we just create the space for them to grow as a person. And then, then you also, we spend a lot of hours together. That's true, <laughs> and time will do that for you. Yeah, but um, I, to, to just succinctly answer your question, I think it's them feeling safe and feeling seen and heard. Um, I think that is what makes them then respect each other so much and value mm -hmm. what they have um, and want to keep coming back. <laughs> Because every time I looked at them, I thought, these kids want to be here and want to be a part of whatever's happening. They want it. And I think that's one of the most admirable things. But let's get to the meat of the matter here, the space, because you spoke of the space. And you did it so eloquently that people think it's a space. No, it's a space. It is a fully functional studio that is soundproof it's set up for the sound it's set up for the lighting it is set up for performance it's a performing space which means it has to be a huge investment how important was this investment for the continuation of operation super important it was crucial um to understand how important it is i have to go back a little bit mm -hmm. in that when we started we were a summer camp we were renting by the hour um and we started at the um, our lady queen of the universe uh, catholic church their their hall in black rock right then we moved to rockley and that was daunting just thinking about having your own space can you sustain this and so on but we were there and it was great to have that space but every time we had to transfer to our production to say the frank column hall it was always um 
a little difficult in the first two years because um, you were in a space that was smaller than where you were going. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't make for efficient rehearsals. So then we started moving about three to four weeks before we were going to the hall to the Springer Memorial School in the heat and everything outside mm -hmm. to and taped it down like the hall to make sure that we could um, rehearse as almost exactly as it would be so that we could transfer to the hall. The reason for that is because there is a big dollar, yeah. uh, you know, behind our ticket behind getting the hall for that long period of time. And we're probably one of maybe two or three organizations that rent the Frank Colma Hall um, every year pre-COVID um, uh, for more than two weeks, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that was one of the major factors in that we needed to find a space where the rooms rooms, not just one room, was big enough yeah. to mimic the space where we may ultimately have our big shows at. The other reason why this space was important was we wanted to make sure that we did compromise quality of learning and, and, and teaching by having um, classes that were too big. So, so we wanted to make sure that we could have multiple classes going on so that we could grow our cohort, mm -hmm. um, but not compromise on quality of the training. Um, and also, we wanted to make sure that we could uh, divide the students in groupings that would allow them to grow and maximize their potential. So you may have a student that may be more advanced in acting, but because their dance may be weaker, before they would their acting class may be decided by their dancing class. And that was really bugging me because I think it was really holding back the right. growth. So now, because we have this space um, with two large rooms for that are outfitted for dance as well as um, drama and, and voice, as well as uh, other spaces like our vocal uh, a music room, our library, our social support counseling room, our kitchen, our lobby, mm -hmm. um, which all feed into, you know, the six programs and services that we offer. Um, we can uh, have a great, a big cohort. We can keep the quality of the classes. We can tailor the classes to make sure that we're catering to the students in the best way possible. Janelle, that is not only a massive investment, but I can't help but think that at the ground level, we must be missing out on incredible opportunities because we don't have these infrastructures in place or in play at the national level. What opportunities are we missing out on? I think we're missing out on maximizing our full creative potential as a nation. Um, I have spoken to several people who are not Bajan, but either live here or visit, and have mentioned that we seem to have an extraordinary percentage of people who are really talented musically or artistically for a nation so small. And yet, we don't really have a national theater space, you know, that's outfitted for the 21st century. Um, and so I think we're missing out on our future to put it bluntly. Um, you know, I, I talk to young people all the time and um, creatives and um, the ones that are in our program are blessed to have the space that we have, um, but we we there are others that don't. And, and there should be more spaces like the one that we have so that students can really maximize their potential. Um, and that's basic, like making sure that you are dancing on a floor that won't cause you injury. Yeah. You know, like that's just basic um, and, and shouldn't be seen as a nice to have. It's essential um, being able to have access to equipment so that if you are a singer, that you can still explore piano and guitar so that you can accompany yourself. Um, being um, performing and having access to the correct mics and, um, you know, you know, being an actor and having Basic props like uh, props, doors, blocks, um, uh, flats, different things like that, that you can then dream up things with, you know, like having some of these basic things will help our students or young people 
And even our older creatives who are still slugging out and wanting to create things mm -hmm. um, to really just dream and not have to sort of make do with minimal or less than likely circumstances. Now, we as artists, we are resourceful. So mm -hmm. you, you give us a little, we'll make it a lot. Right. But imagine how much further we could go if that major investment was made. And it doesn't mean that you're going to have thousands of Rihanna's. There shouldn't be anyway. There's only no one. We just need the one. But we <laughs> love the one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it does mean you create space for the next whoever yeah. to come. And you also indirectly affect every other industry there is. Because my mind just went crazy. I'm thinking, what about the MUAs, the makeup artists, costume designers, yep. uh, people who make wigs, people who build those elaborate sets, yep. um, engineers who would help you with that flowing. Yep. I can think of no industry that could not be directly impacted by the arts that you couldn't possibly use. And, and that's just what you mentioned in the sort of microcosm of performing arts. Yeah. But if you have a student who is in a space like this, who's challenged to think creatively, who who is challenged to critically think, um, who is engaged in literature and even science, because we did a show, uh, we worked on a show, COVID shut it down, but we worked on a show called The Theory of Relativity, yes, yes, which yes. explores physics and yes. science um, and, you know, uh, chemistry and all of that, um, you then also impact those who will go on to other pursuits because they're going to think outside of the box. Mm -hmm. When you give them a problem, even in a lab, they're not going to go, oh, woe is me, I can't fix it. Right. They're going to go, all right, I've done 12 hour rehearsals, seven days a week. I, I, can, I can fix it. I can fix it. <laughs> I just need a minute to sit yeah. down and think. Let's talk it through. We can. We got this. Yeah. So I think it will impact the fabric of our nation if we create more spaces for our people to just think yeah. freely and out of the box and not just regurgitate information to pass an exam. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go even as far to say I think there needs to be an overhaul of how we think about education. Okay. Education is key to, to everything else. Yes. But if we just think about education as sitting at a chair, looking at a board, writing down what the teacher says and then just spewing that back out to pass an exam, then we have missed an opportunity for forward thinking to propel us into the future. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we, and I, I talk to people in various levels of education, whether it's tertiary, primary, secondary, there is a cry out there saying there is a, there is a problem. Yeah. Um, and I think that creative arts can be a big solution for that. Um, why can't a student who may not be good at that regurgitating mm -hmm. um, not present their uh, information that they've learned about the atomic structure by creating a choreography for it? Yes. Why can't we structure our learning in a way that it meets the student where they're at and celebrates who they are from the get-go? Because again, that confidence that you create by just allowing them to be safe, to be themselves and mm -hmm. not be measured by one rubric. Right. Right. Will allow them to just traverse life completely differently. But if you tell them from infants, A, you're not good enough. So you're going to be in this class. Yes. You sort of chop them at the knees. Sorry to be so, so graphic, but it, it you really it's are. Really what it is? Though. You're chopping them at the knee, and then you're missing out in your nation from all these creative, out of both box thinkers from from agriculture to agriculture mm -hmm. to astrophysicists, you know, and the arts. You're missing out on on what we could be. And I know that we are not only good enough. We have proven that we can excel. We get excited when we hear, oh, so-and-so is in the Lion King. Mm -hmm. From Ricky Stout to Dwayne Hines, mm -hmm. Rihanna has another skincare line that we swipe in that card to get. Another number one, we'll wait on that album, sis. We'll wait. <laughs> um, you know, and, you know, somebody has to make the wigs for Bridgerton. 
do the makeup for cats. Yeah. And we have the talent. My fear is, is we are letting it all slip away from us instead of creating the atmosphere so that not only can we retain the people, not because we want to keep them imprisoned, but we want to build it and flourish it here. Why can't somebody from London come here to say, well, I've worked with OTT because they're doing the production of Emerton mm -hmm. with the score being done by His Excellency, the mighty Gabby. Mm -hmm. I mean, that brings chills just thinking about it. And it shouldn't have to bring chills, it should bring money. It should bring commerce, it should bring opportunity. It should, it definitely should, but it's a long-term game. It's a long-term investment yes. that um, those with money need to see. It's important to play or to engage in that long-term investment. Mm -hmm. You will not necessarily um, get the rewards right, right away, but what what is the reward? You know, is it advertising space mm -hmm. only? I mean, that's important. That's an, it's a reward. It, yes. yes, but there there is also changing the social fabric of your nation. Okay. <laughs> you know, investing in that. You know, it's it's also if you really want to get narrow. It's changing a life. Yeah, and that's really where it's at for me. You know, I get goosebumps just saying that because literally you can change a life by by making that investment. And for many people. It, it will cost them nothing really to give a couple hundred thousand, you know, yeah. um, uh, into the arts, um, but it may mean the world to someone else. Um, and I think it, it just needs to be done at this point. I mean, even if you want to go from a business point of view, from a tourism point of view, if we're going to rethink tourism, why not have original shows that are worked that have been given the investment and time to be reworked and reworked again just like Hamilton took six or seven Absolutely. years to be done um, and the artists you know have things in place to still eat and make their and be well mm -hmm. while creating um, why not invest in that so that then you can have work that not only is creatively beautiful and moving but then is constantly then feeding into that entertainment um, business or industry because you have royalties, mm -hmm. right? Like it's not, it's not rocket science. There is literally dollars and cents. You can track where yeah. the money can all go and how else, why would people get into it? Exactly. <laughs> and you can see how it can benefit so many people because this is a team sport, yeah. right? This is a team thing. Like everybody from food services all the way up, right? Yeah. Can benefit, but in order to get there, the investment needs to be made. And I hope that we can make that shift. I know we're trying to do our little bit, um, um, and I'm hoping that in being as excellent as we can with as little as we have, um, that people can see that this is worth it. Um, and that's why our bridge program is important too, because we were like, to show people that this is possible, we need to make it happen yeah. somehow. beautifully articulated what keeps you fed, what keeps you motivated to wake up every morning and think what else can I do for OTT. But what will success look like for you where OTT is concerned? I think that it is twofold. Um, but ultimately, I think it's the lives changed. Um, the excellence that we require of the students and the work ethic if I tell them, if we can infect the world with that, if you can be on time and you can be a good team player and you can be someone that someone wants to hire again and again, then I think I've done the job and OTT has done the job in terms of elevating a life to a point where you can do anything. And therefore that then multiplies because wherever you go, you go you're going to then walk with that excellence, that dedication. And hopefully then that will cause others to step up and to raise their game just because, well, somebody's going to hire that person again and again. So if that's what it takes to be hired again, hopefully then other people will then step up their game and hopefully then that will change the industry. Um, so I think 
It's about the lives changed and their trajectories change and the ethos that they carry within them and how that then affects the industry here and anywhere in the world. If you want to talk about tangibles, um, I think that success would also be continuing to grow and evolve with or without me. I think that that, that would be the legacy to, to that this thing, whatever it is, continues to multiply and grow. It may look like buildings, it may look like theaters, it may look like schools, or it may look like the next big star. Um, it may look like policy change, but if there can be a multiplying fa um, effect of the passion um, that I have, um, that then being expressed uniquely in many more souls, I think that would be what the success would be for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> and because you mentioned it, legacy, what legacy would you want OTT uh, to leave on the fabric of Barbados and the history of the world? Um, I think I think they're almost the same in terms of that there was this unique thing that happened on this tiny rock in the middle of the ocean that produced all these wonderful people who went on to do all kinds of things, but in their own right affected change wherever they went. I think if that that would be the legacy that I think would I would want it to to be um, at the end of the day I my name could be on a building but OTT's name may resound and resonate for 50 years from now I don't know but we really truly live on I think for me it's the people that you change the, the lives that you touch and so if you know the kids are in in our sports program now that are four years old 40 years from now and talk about how learning about um, using their voice fully and injecting truth into whatever they do and being living their authentic selves, if they can remember that and pass that down, I think that would be the legacy for me more than anything else. Janelle, I cannot tell you the fire you have lit in me, in this series, in this team, and in Barbados, especially through your students and just your belief in them and their belief in you. Operation Triple Threat is just a story that deserves to be told and heard many, many times with its many, many variations at its many, many different stages because I feel like it will be around for a long time, like an institution, it deserves that. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time today to share your story and your passion with us. Thank you so much for creating a safe space for me to tell the story. Um, it means a lot to me to be seen and heard in this way. I'm tearing up for some reason now, um, but I am passionate about it. And it's because of the pain that I've experienced that I've chosen to fight hard for the generations to come after me. And I'm grateful that people have come alongside and seen it, heard it, and see, that's pretty good, you know, and um, have chosen to give us a space to tell our story. So hopefully other people will come on board and help us. I want to thank you all so much for taking the time today to not only appreciate a good story, but understand the movement that is happening. Every time you hear an ad for a production, you buy a ticket, you buy a ticket for someone else, you support a child's dream, you have no idea the legacy you're leaving behind and the lives that you change, but know that you are. Trust me when I tell you, take the opportunity to do it. We, not, we may not be a Janelle Headley, but each and every one of us in our fullness can change a life. Don't let the opportunity pass you. And do not miss another installment of the Pivot Series.